Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We're going to let folks sign on. This is Jen Kovach Bordnick with the eHealth Initiative. Welcome this afternoon. Actually, it's this morning still, 11 o'clock. Um, welcome to the webinar. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Hi, everybody. We will be getting started in just a moment with the webinar. We're going to let folks sign on for another minute or so. Thanks for your patience. Claudia, while we're waiting for folks to join, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide just so folks can see the um, title. Great. For those of you just joining us, welcome. This is the EHI webinar on breaking down the interoperability and information blocking final rules. And we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, Claudia, I'm going to go ahead and start going through some of the housekeeping items while we let folks continue to um, join us. If you could go back, actually, to the agenda. Thanks for joining us today. This is Jen kovach bordnick the CEO of the eHealth Initiative. We're delighted to have you join us today for this really um, interesting issue today, and, and it's great to see so many familiar names joining us today from across the health and technology industries. I can see all the different folks. We've got uh, several hundred folks joining us today, um, and we recognize this is a really trying time for many of you in the healthcare industry. Um, we are certainly not in the same place we were two weeks ago when we first scheduled this webinar. So um, that said, there's still an overwhelming amount of interest in this topic, so we really wanted to try to navigate through some of those issues today. Um, so we're glad that you took the time to join us today. And, and there's certainly been a lot of discussion about what's going to happen with the rules, the potential delay of the rules, and we will get into all of that um, in just a moment. Um, but first, I really want to thank those of you who are joining us from your living rooms and bedrooms, your makeshift uh, offices, your kitchen tables. I think we are all um, experiencing the same thing right now with uh, children and pets and remote learning taking place in the background. Um, so I certainly want to let you know I am experiencing that myself and many of our speakers as well today. So please excuse that if you hear that today in the background. Um, and I also want to really thank PwC for their truly generous support of this event today and this program today. Um, more than anything, I really do want to thank the frontline clinicians and the providers and the administrative staff and all of those who are not here with us today who are providing patient care and, and behind the scenes, um, all of those hospital workers, everybody dusting off those emergency plans that we, you know, you think you won't have to um, deal with, and dealing with the real crisis in our nation right now. And our thoughts are with you, and we support the critical work that you're doing and, and know that you're at your best right now. So I really want to thank everybody who's not with us today as well. Um, also, just a quick um, note, this webinar, and I think we did send a note out about this, is probably going to go over 60 minutes. So plan for this being a little bit longer program today. It could go up to 90 minutes today. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about who we're going to have um, on the call today, Claudia. We've got an incredible lineup, a, a really stellar group of speakers with us today. Um, Crystal Yadak, Yednak, excuse me, the Senior Manager of PwC's Health Research Institute, the group that does all of those incredible reports that you see numbers all over the place. Um, HRI is just a great institution, and we're really fortunate to have Crystal with us today. 
um, Lisa Gallagher, Managing Director at PwC, Lee Burchell, who many of you know from the EHR um, industry, um, Government Relations at Allscripts, um, Colby Tyner, representing the um, consumer um, perspective today, who is comes to us from the American Heart Association, Digital Health and Cardiovascular Systems, um, the policy analyst there. Um, we're delighted to have Danielle Lloyd with us, a senior VP at AHIP, um, another very busy person dealing with um, health plans and, and um, how they're dealing with the COVID-19 crisis right now. So we're delighted that she took time to be with us today. And our very own um, Alice Leiter, um, VP and senior counsel with EHI, who's going to be speaking with us as well today, giving us some legal perspective and, and privacy perspective um, as well. So next slide. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, everybody is muted right now, but we want your questions. In fact, we actually got questions in advance today of the webinar, and um, we've got a lot of questions lined up to go through. If you want um, your question to be um, shared with the speakers today during the program, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Do not confuse that with the chat box. <laughs> uh, the chat box is if you have technical difficulties, but if you have an actual content question about the rules or just kind of an opinion, um, what some of these um, really stellar individuals think about the rules, put that in the Q&A box at the bottom there, and then we'll be able to get to it. And then finally, the slides. Everybody always asks, can I get a copy of the slides? Yes, 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 um, you can. <laughs> um, there's a link right there, and that's where the slides are available. We're also really excited to share with you that um, by 1 o'clock today, you're going to get an email. Everybody on the call today um, will get a copy of the slides. You'll get a copy of PwC's um, report um, about the rules. Um, EHI also has a summary of the rules you'll be getting today, and then you'll be getting a copy of ONC's materials as well. So we're going to be sending you today a whole set of resources that you can tap into about the rules. Next slide, Claudia. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I do want to let folks know, um, you know, EHI represents and works with a number of healthcare leaders across the industry, and this is just a sampling of them. And as I mentioned before, we're really proud of the work that our members and that our non-members and that everybody's doing right now to address the crisis. Claudia, next slide. Um, our mission is really to convene executives, identify best practices, and really help transform healthcare. And um, if you go to the next slide, Claudia. These are our areas of focus that we generally work on. Uh, next slide. But this is what we're spending a lot of time working on right now, and this is the COVID-19 crisis. We've lined up a series of educational um, webinars over the next couple of weeks working with different members and trying to identify best practices um, for you leaders out there in the industry to figure out how to address this crisis right now. We're looking at AI, we're looking at remote monitoring, we're looking at telehealth, um, and this is just a sampling. We actually just got off the phone this morning and have a number of other activities we will be announcing. We've also been sharing resources and um, information about what a number of our member organizations are doing to address this right now and, and share as much as we can. So I encourage you to um, sign up for these events. Um, you're welcome to spread this information as broadly as you'd like. Um, we welcome anyone to these. And, and I do want to put out an ask as well if you are aware of um, really successful um, activities activities or technology that's being used right now to help um, address some of the challenges, we would be delighted to highlight them um, in some of our activities. So I do want to share that. Next slide. And here's a um, copy of the link. Claudia is actually also emailing this out um, right after the session today. But PwC has done an incredible report, um, Beyond IT, Why the Regulatory Push Toward Interoperability Requires Whole Organizational Responses from Providers and Payers. Really a great piece of work. So I really encourage you to go and download that. Um, it's just a great resource for organizations. So uh, please uh, click on that link right away and, and, and pull that down. That's important. Great piece of work. Next slide. And I think I want to just say this one more time. We really want to thank um, PwC. We couldn't do programs like this without their support, and it's great to work with leaders like them. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal Yednak um, with PwC, who's going to talk us through the rest of the program um, today. And I will be back to do questions at the end. Quick reminder, put your questions in there at the bottom through that Q&A. 
Uh, Crystal, you ready? Thank you, Jen. Yes, welcome, everyone. Uh, we do have a great panel of experts at, from across the healthcare spectrum who will be discussing the impact of the rules. And I know you want to get right to it, so I'll keep this quick. Just a, a brief uh, look at our agenda for today. We're going to do an overview of the rules by my colleague, Lisa Gallagher. And after Lisa leads us through that, our other panelists will provide their perspective of the impact of the rules on various parts of the healthcare system, as well as on patients. I will then moderate a short Q&A with some of the bigger questions, and we know you have lots of questions, so then Jennifer will run through some of those. Now, I want to introduce my colleague, Lisa Gallagher. Lisa is a managing director in PwC's Health Industries Advisory, and she specializes in cybersecurity and privacy. She served as co-chair for the Standards Committee of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, and she also was a vice president for HIMSS. So, Lisa, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, well, thank you, Crystal. And good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Um, first of all, on a personal note, I want to join Jen in saying um, thank you for joining us today. And for those of you who haven't been able to join us, thank you as well. I hope everyone's families are doing well in this very trying time. And secondly, I want to say a profound thank you to every one of our hardworking medical professionals. As you know, I do believe that we're all in this together, and I know we're all working hard to both do our jobs and, and protect our families and our friends. But there are folks that go above and beyond every single day. And those are our dedicated medical professionals. So I wanted to say we recognize you, we thank you. Um, and um, with that, uh, let's get started. So um, in terms of the agenda for today, um, my role on this webinar is to give a high level overview of the ONC and CMS rules. I'm gonna try to give you a summary that enables you to understand the, the content of the rules and the regulatory deadline. But I wanna stress that I'm also joined today by the experts that um, Jen mentioned earlier, who are going to talk about the impact of the rules on the various stakeholder groups and help answer some of your questions. So we've got quite a, a panel today, and um, you'll get lots of perspectives. So <clears throat> in terms of the agenda, I'm going to start get by giving a quick perspective on the national journey for health data interoperability. And I'm going to talk at a high level about the goals of HHS here, which are myriad. And then I'll give a summary of each of the rules, the ONC rule and the CMS rule, respectively. Um, a couple of key items to mention here. We know the rule is out, okay? Um, but that really means it's available to view. Um, the rules are not officially final. So what we have is a, is a pre-publication version. As far as the regulatory deadlines, the official publication date will start the clock for when the rules are uh, for, for the regulatory deadlines. And that publication date is when it's formally published in the Federal Register. So that'll start the countdown in terms of days and months for the deadline. And on another note, um, we have heard that it is possible that uh, HHS could defer or delay the deadlines due to the national situation around COVID-19. So, in fact, a CMS official acknowledged during an advisory committee meeting um, that there may need to be some adjustment made to the regulatory deadline. Um, we don't know for sure, but um, it is a possibility um, in terms of what what um, the nation is facing and the work that HHS is doing. So stay tuned there. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, in terms of a historical timeline, um, you know, HHS has been working on the collection and use of electronic health data for years. So um, really that was begun to for, be formalized when ONC was established by executive order way back in 2004. Um, a number of other things happened along the way, and even in between um, regulatory and statutory activity, um, ONC in particular was working on a national, nationwide interoperability roadmap 
Um, the Federal Advisory Committee on which I worked um, helped provide input to that. A 10-year plan was provided to the industry in 2015, and they continue to update that, right? So um, <clears throat> the work has been ongoing by various federal advisory committees that work with industry and also by collaborative efforts in the industry, by industry trade associations, standards, organizations, et cetera. But with the 21st Century Cures Act, Congress made it clear that in order to meet our national goals for health of the nation, right, clarity on the goals and expectations around interoperability was needed. And they um, mandated by statute that HHS do some rulemaking in this area. So at the highest level, the, the 21st Century Act itself provided a definition of interoperability um, that included the requirement that all electronically accessible health information must be able to be accessed, exchanged, and used without special effort on the part of the user. As I mentioned, the act also called for HHS rulemaking, specifically on interoperability, information blocking, and patient access to their data. <clears throat> and it required updates to ONC's uh, health, tech health information technology certification criteria. And that was to make sure that certified products support information exchange. And it also asked uh, Office of the National Coordinator to establish what's called conditions and maintenance of certification requirements, which I'll talk about later. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the overall goals of the rule? The, the goals of the rule are to make sure that the health healthcare system begins to actively and comprehensively share data. Um, so data would move from patient to provider and provider to provider and from health plan to health plan. Um, that that patient data is made available electronically through mobile means and web-based applications through the implementation of APIs, which I'll talk about later. And that free flow of information would empower patients and also help, help improve value-based care efforts and patient safety. Um, so the, the benefits of the rule, which I don't have listed on this slide, but this, these were expressed by ONC. For patients, they would have access to their information while having their privacy and security protected. And they will have the ability to share and move their information as they deem necessary. For doctors and hospitals, making requests for charts from other institutions easy and inexpensive to respond to allowing choice and flexibility on the technology they can use and how they implement it. And in, in the te technology area in particular, it's um, also meant to expand um, <clears throat> to new entrants in the technology sector um, that would be beneficial for care. For health IT developers, minimizing the need, the ongoing API development and maintenance costs by standardizing their and helping to facilitate innovation and new technology entrance in the market, as I mentioned. And for the American public as a whole, maximizing innovation and transparency in healthcare and improving patient safety. So those are the expressed benefits by ONC. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, who are the entities to which the rules apply. There are four categories of what ONC calls actors, providers, payers, developers, and third-party uh, apps. Um, so for providers, um, they'll be required at a high level to um, make patient data, what they call EHI, available through application programming interfaces, uh, push out notifications in terms of admission, discharge, and transfer of patients, and uh, explicitly prohibit them from blocking information. Uh, for payers, patient claim and health data would be made available as well through APIs and could um, be pushed out to other payers as patients move from plan to plan. For developers, it mandates the use of APIs and also provides new certification requirements as well What's not on the slide for developers is that information blocking is also prohibited for them. And the third parties um, can use APIs to actually access the information on behalf of a patient. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of standards, uh, transition from the use of CCDA to the new US CDI, which I'll talk about in detail later. Next slide, please. And so um, 
I'm going to structure this by going through the ONC rule first and then going through the CMS rule. So um, starting on slide seven with the ONC rule, um, <clears throat> first, the ONC rule covers two main areas, health IT certification and information blocking. Um, with that said, I'll also briefly summarize some standards clarifications that were made and also discuss this concept of conditions and maintenance of certification requirements that was included in 21st Century's Cures. So, in terms of the health IT certification criteria, there's a few things to note here. Um, the changes to the latest version of the certification, certification criteria, which is called 2015 Health IT Certification Criteria, um, are captured not by issuing a new set of criteria, but by editing the 2015 certification criteria and changing the name. So then the, the uh, relevant um, issue of those certification criteria is called the 2015 edition cures update. Um, so in that category, there were updates made um, in terms of some requirements that had been previously time limited and some criteria were removed. You can look for details in the rule or in some of the published summaries. Um, there were several areas of criteria that were added. Um, so for um, the primary new requirements for health IT are export of electronic health information and standardization around um, APIs. So for the export um, function, that focuses on the ability for the export of the EHI that's stored in and, and maintained by certified health IT products. And this supports patient access as well as um, support to the provider's interest in terms of ex in exporting an entire population to transfer to another health IT system. Um, so we'll talk about the two export requirements in detail a bit later. And then the other requirement for standardized API for patient and population services, this requires an API interface in certified health information technology using uh, HL7 FHIR release 4, and it <clears throat> specifies several implementation specifications. Uh, certification is limited to the API-enabled read services as special, specified in FHIR version 4. Um, another new area of requirements is the privacy and security transparency attestations. So the final rule adopts two new privacy and certification, uh, certification criteria requiring transparency tr attestation. So the EHR or other health IT um, developer needs to attest that they have, um, that they encrypt authentication credentials and they use multi-factor authentication. Okay. So um, let's go to the next slide and we'll talk a bit about the information blocking uh, provisions in the rule. Okay. So as far as information blocking goes, there is a definition um, contained within the, um, the rule. And you can see that on the slide. Um, so any practice that is likely to interfere with, prevent, or material discourage, materially discourage access or exchange the use of EHI except where required by law or specified by the secretary as reasonable and necessary activity. So that's a little bit of a convoluted definition, but it's important to understand that ONC took the definition that was provided in the rule, in the um, 21st Century Cures Act and actually specified um, some exceptions. So as to be very clear as to what the scope of information blocking is and what it isn't. So <clears throat> it defines in the final rule eight exceptions that would apply to certain activities that do in fact 
or do actually interfere with the access exchange or use of EHI and that do constitute information blocking, but that are allowable because they're deemed reasonable and necessary. And those are listed here uh, on the slide. So the eight exceptions are listed in the right-hand column. The exceptions are really to um, allow uh, the uh, health IT uh, vendors to actually um, protect the patient and operate in a manner that promotes privacy and security. And they're actually categorized by ONC. So one category of the exceptions addresses the activities to promote public confidence in the use of health IT and the exchange of health IT. And, and that means they're intended to protect patient safety and pr promote privacy and security. Another category of exceptions here addresses the activities to promote competition and consumer welfare. These exceptions, for example, would allow for the recovery of costs reasonably incurred um, from an actor responding to requests. Um, it, it talks about those requests that are uh, infeasible and also permitting the licensing of interoperability elements on reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. Another area of exceptions addresses activities that promote the performance of the health IT. So it recognizes that actors might be able to or may make health IT temporarily unavailable for maintenance or improvement that benefit the overall performance and usability of the health IT itself. So they have some very important reasons for um, these exceptions. The exceptions have certain criteria that need to be met. Um, and so um, they're, they're spelled out for the health IT developers. Um, it also specifies a couple of uh, clarifications. So when certain criteria are met, um, that it wouldn't be considered interference with just an information blocking actor engaged in practices to educate the patients about the privacy and security of the apps that they choose to receive their EHI. So there's been a lot of talk about the data could be exchanged through an API with a vendor's product that isn't covered by HIPAA. And what this says is that if, um, if the health IT uh, developer or vendor takes on activities to educate patients at the privacy and security risks, that's not considered information blocking. Um, <clears throat> also with regard to contracts that are previously in place that may now violate these new rules, they clarified that information blocking provision does not require them to vi violate existing business associate agreements or associated service level agreements. Um, there is a a provision that says um, if the agreements could constitute an interference if used in a discriminatory manner by an actor to limit or pr prohibit use of the EHI that would otherwise be permitted by the privacy rule. So um, they have some very specific um, terms and conditions of compliance and they have very specific um, criteria for the exceptions. And in terms of penalties, um, the penalties specified in the final rule are up to $1 million for all actors except for providers. And they stated that provider penalties will be announced in future um, rulemaking. So we don't know the scope and nature of the penalties for providers at this point. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of the standards criteria, um, uh, there were several um, areas that the ONC final rule covered. First of all, uh, the data standard and the migration from or the transition by the industry from the CCDA standard to the US CDI standard. That's required within 24 months of enactment of the rule. So a little history here in its early focus on EHR incentive programs, which are now called promoting oper interoperability. Uh, ONC worked with CMS to define a common set of meaningful use data types. So that that was, you know, related to the meaningful use program and requirements. As the program expanded beyond CMS to generally op emphasize open, accessible, and interoperable 
um, data exchange, uh, the common data set was renamed to the common clinical data set, the CCDA. And that content, that common clinical data set was included in the 2015 edition certification criteria. In the final rule, however, they noted that the industry um, believes that it's time to move on beyond the inherent limitations of the CCDS structure and um, do that in order to enhance interoperability. So it, it, it states that CCDS, CCDS will be replaced by USCDI um, <clears throat> and all of its references in the 2015 edition would be changed. Um, so the USCDI has a February 2020 version one date and it's a standardized set of both health data classes and individual data elements for health data exchange. Um, other areas that they touch on uh, in terms of the standards criteria include e-prescribing criteria and cl clinical quality measures. And those are, um, those are updated uh, versions and standards and implementation guides that are included in the final rule. Um, <clears throat> I, I, on this slide, I also mentioned that um, in the US CDI, there are some new fields um, that are important to note. Um, those include fields for provenance, what is the origin of the data, clinical field notes, pediatric data sign, vital signs, and demographic information, and that includes name, email, and phone. Um, and so it's important to note that the demographic information is, is intel, intended to begin helping with patient record mac, matching. Um, and uh, finally, ONC noted that um, the US CDI is going to be um, undergoing an annual update schedule. So they're going to establish a process for that that's transparent and collaborative with industry to update it over time, including public comment activities. So in terms of the US CDI, that will continue to evolve and they will um, create a process for public involvement in that evolution. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this um, terminology that was in the 21st Century Cures Act called conditions and maintenance of certification requirements. So, um, there was, there was discussion in the 21st Century Cures Act about how, um, what is the obligation of the health IT certified product developer to um, meet the original uh, criteria for certification and actually maintain that over time. So ONC explained in the final rule that they intended to implement this using an approach under which the conditions and maintenance of certification expresses both the initial and the ongoing requirements for certification of uh, products under the program. Um, the maintenance certification requirements are now standalone requirements. So you have the initial set that they're certified against, and then there's a set of maintenance requirements. Um, and so ONC really believes that this approach establishes a clear baseline for the technical and behavioral conditions with evidence that the conditions are continually being met through these new maintenance requirements. If under the rule, if they're not met, the health IT developer may lo no longer uh, participate in the certification program and or its certification could be revoked. So I've listed here the, um, the areas in which um, the requirements for uh, conditions and maintenance of certification are specified. There's categories there, information blocking. The health IT developer can't take any actions that constitute information blocking. Assurances, the health IT developer has to provide assurances to HHS that will not take any action to block or otherwise inhibit information sharing. So there's an individual requirement to not information block and there's a requirement to provide assurances to HHS that they won't. Um, there's an extensive new section on communications and this is an area where um, they specify that the developer cannot prohibit or restrict the following um, 
in terms of business practices of the developer. So usability, interoperability, security, user experiences, et cetera. Um, there's, a, there's a section in here that talks about screenshots and uh, many of you may recall in the proposed rule um, that the, they explicitly stated that um, health IT developers were not allowed to restrict the sharing of screenshots of their health IT. Um, some developers had been doing those kinds of restrictions saying that it violated um, their uh, intellectual property rights. Um, ONC in the, in the final rule um, not only clarified that you, they couldn't restrict the sharing of screenshots, but they also expanded it to include other kinds of communications and explicitly extended it to video. So video is also something they can't um, restrict. And um, they, uh, so in terms of screenshots, they, they doubled down on that and they said also video um, is included in that. So, in terms of APIs, um, scope of the data that are available is limited to the data set specified in the US CDI. Um, in terms of the conditions of certification, so this is a new area of certification. Uh, conditions of certification for APIs include transparency, fees, openness, and pro-competitive pro nature. And the maintenance requirements are authenticate, authentic authenticity verification, application registration, and service level URL publication. In terms of real world testing, health IT developer must successfully test their product in the real world um, using, in the setting for the type, of which, the type of which it is marketed. So if you market it for a specific type of setting, you have to actually execute real world testing. And in terms of maintenance requirements, it must submit a plan for the real world testing, submit the results, and notify of any nonconformity. Um, and ONC has also defined a process for reviewing um, the certified health IT to enforce the conditions and maintenance of certification. So they've included all of that within um, the update to the 2015 certification requirements. And that's a lot. <laughs> Oh, that's, that just about covers it at a high level. So um, next slide, please. So um, in their latest um, publications, informational activity, and also in a recent webinar, ONC has published a very nice uh, regulatory schedule um, for you as a reference. I couldn't improve upon it, so I just included it in here. Um, now, note that these dates do talk about dates, uh, lapsed amount of time after publication, and please remember that that is publication in the Federal Register, which we have not seen yet. And also note that these deadlines could possibly be delayed due to the current national situation. But this is a good reference for everyone. Okay, so um, I'd like to move forward to talk about the CMS rule. Um, the interoperability and patient access final rule. So the final rule by CMS is focused on, of course, driving interoperability and patient access to their health information. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the final rule for CMS um, includes a number of new policies. And I have slides in this deck that are gonna go over each of these, um, but you can see them listed here uh, with the uh, regulatory deadlines listed here as well. Next slide, please. All right, so we have on this slide a patient access API and a provider directory API. So those are, these are requirements specified in the CMS final rule. So CMS regulated payers are required to implement and maintain a secure standards-based API that allows patients to easily access their claims and encounter information, including costs and a subset that's defined of their clinical information uh, through the third-party application of their choice. So that means the patient chooses the application and presents it and makes the request for their data. 
Um, they also specify the HL7 fire release four to be consistent with the ONC rule. Okay, and then in terms of the pro provider directory API, CMS has required payers um, to make provider directory information publicly available via standards-based API. And their view is that making this information broadly available encourages innovation by allowing third-party developers of applications to access information to create services to help patients find providers for care and treatment, as well as help clinicians find other providers for care coordination. Um, so this is a very important requirement for them as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so then we have a requirement for payer-to-payer -payer data exchange. Um, CMS regulated payers are required to exchange certain patient clinical data using the USCDI at the patient's request, allowing the patient to take the, their information with them as they move from payer to payer. Um, this will help them make that move and also over time create a cumulative health care record with their current payer. Um, this is basically des designed to facilitate information um, sharing, informed decision making, efficient care, and can lead to better health air outcomes. Um, okay, and then finally, the dual eligible federal state information exchanges. So the final rule updates the requirements for states to exchange certain enrollee data for individuals that are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. And the information that's exchanged are both state buy-in files and MMA files. The, the final rule makes a change from monthly exchange of data to daily exchange of the data to improve dual eligibility benefit experience, ensure beneficiaries are getting appropriate services and that the services are billed appropriately the first time. So um, the dual eligible requirement is um, also very important for um, our dual eligible uh, Medicare and Medicaid enrollees. Okay, um, next slide, please. So here we see that ON, a CMS also addresses information blocking. Um, in terms of public reporting and information blocking, um, in early 2020 uh, or late 2020, CMS will publicly report eligible clinicians, hospitals, and critical access hospitals that may be information blocking based on how they attested to certain promoting interoper interoperability program requirements, those former um, meaningful use requirements. Um, they'll know which providers have attested and can help patients choose providers more likely to support electronic access to their healthcare. So they will actually publicly uh, point out who is information blocking and make that available to patients. Digital contact information. Um, so they'll begin publicly reporting providers that do not list or update their digital contact information in the national plan and provider enumeration system. Um, so this includes providing digital contact information such as secure digital endpoints like direct, a direct address or a fire API endpoint. Um, CMS believes making this list of providers who did not make their digital contact information public will encourage providers to put this information as a priority to, to help facilitate care coordination and data exchange. CMS is also requiring um, or actually modifying their condi conditions of participation to require hospitals uh, to send electronic patient event notification called admission, discharge, and transfer to another healthcare facility or to another community provider or to another practitioner. This push of ADT notifications will help improve care coordination um, and the policy will go in effect fairly quickly, six months after publication of the rule. Okay, so that is my um, very quick summary of the rules on the next slide. Um, we at PwC, you'll see in the HRI, HRI paper, we have tried to lay out some uh, 
next steps for organizations in considering how to meet these rules. Um, and here we talk about, you know, who is it in your organization that's going to lead the, not only the implementation of the interoperability requirements, but also, uh, in fact, a project that might be considered a regulatory compliance project. Who's going to lead that and how is it going to be structured? Taking a look at your data to understand uh, not only what data you have, but how it flows. Um, take a look at the challenge of patient matching and communicate with other um, other organizations, including your own uh, health IT vendors, about uh, planned updates that will implement the, the technology that's needed for you to meet the requirements. Uh, review business partnerships and agreements, and then also, um, you know, a lot of the implementation of this may be process and workflow related, so take a look at what are the new processes, workflows, and functions that need to be considered and put together a project schedule and how to deal with those and how to uh, minimize workforce impact as well as, you know, meet the compliance schedule. And um, this should be part of an overall data or digitization strategy as well. So uh, more on this in the PwC paper um, that you got a link for earlier. And then next slide, please. I have a list um, of some key links to get information directly from ONC and CMS. This is a pretty bare bones list, um, but and you can get information on the EHI website and on the PwC website, as well as just Googling it. But these are from um, ONC and CMS themselves. Um, so with that, Crystal, I will turn it back over to you um, for the rest of the program. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for that overview. And now we will turn it over to Lee from Allscripts. Thank you. Had to get off mute. Um, all right, let me, oops, my name is spelled wrong. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the ONC rule from the developer's perspective. The CMS rule um, does have one element, the patient notification element, um, you know, that health IT vendors will uh, be key in supporting. Um, but other than that, it largely um, does not affect us as software developers too much. So I thought I would focus more on the ONC side. So, um, you know, from our viewpoint, um, we were uh, collectively as a vendor community and certainly speaking for all scripts, uh, very active during the uh, review of the proposed rule, the comment period, um, had a number of conversations uh, with policymakers um, during that time about some things that we were concerned about. Um, there were some elements of what had been proposed that we were really concerned about in terms of um, posing a real risk to the industry's ability to innovate, um, you know, whether it was um, a, a certification uh, change that was you know, really largely unreasonable in terms of the amount of time that was proposed and thus would get in the way of a bunch of other things that we want to do that have been requested by clients. Um, there were some uh, proposals around um, intellectual property licensing, um, not the, the screenshot side of it, but licensing that we felt were um, unreasonable. So there were some things that we had been concerned about, had a lot of conversations, we found uh, HHS to be very receptive and open to conversation, uh, really wanting to kind of understand the practical implications of, of uh, what had been proposed. Um, and our take on the final rule is that it has landed on more of a reasonable um, landing spot, you know, for the most part. So there, um, you know, generally the um, all scripts take on this has been very supportive in terms of needing to address information blocking. Um, we do know that it happens, um, whether intentionally or inadvertently. And so we've been really supportive of this um, from, you know, the time that it was being discussed in Congress. And 
We feel like um, HHS has done um, a really good job of really keeping their eye on patients. Um, you know, the, the concept that patients um, should be at the center of the healthcare system, that they should absolutely have visibility to um, what information is out there about them, who has seen it, where it should go, where it should not go, um, is absolutely something we agree with. And I think you can see that throughout the rule in many, many, many places that there is an attempt to um, really support patients in um, being able to control their data. Um, you know, there's, there was a lot of conversation um, about patient privacy in response to this rule. And, you know, it is a valid issue. Uh, you know, the, the um, increase of API adoption, the, the right of a patient to um, consent their data to um, an app that does not fall under HIPAA, um, does expose, uh, you know, patients to their data being used for a whole number of things that they don't even know is happening. And I think that that's a very real issue. It is a conversation we need to have. ONC did their best, in my opinion, uh, to try to address those concerns, but they have incredibly limited authority when it comes to um, that type of thing. So, you know, they emphasize particularly around the API sections and the sections talking about um, third party apps that people um, or that developers of those apps um, or any terms of use, frankly, should be uh, transparent and very plain language um, communications about what could happen with that data, how it would be used. Um, so they did what they can do, but the reality is, is that, you know, the, the need to modernize our privacy infrastructure uh, to reflect an electronic environment really sits with Congress. So, um, you know, I point that out because it, does, it is something that people continue to be concerned about, um, but, you know, ONC was very, very limited in their ability um, to do something there. So APIs uh, really are kind of the star of the show. Um, if, you, if you look at the requirements um, around this rule, there is, um, you know, a tremendous amount of focus. Uh, you know, there's an API section of the rule that talks about, you know, what needs to happen um, technically, but also um, from a, a pricing element, what your people are allowed to charge for, what they're not allowed to charge for. Um, patients can never be charged um, for their data, which I think, um, you know, is certainly a positive. Um, but um, I will say, you know, I have a little bit of concern um, because people are so fired up about fire, no pun intended, <laughs> um, that, you know, there's a lot of um, eggs being put in the basket of APIs. APIs um, hold tremendous potential. Um, but even when you get to Fire R4 or beyond, um, you know, there's still limitations. There are still many use cases where APIs may not be the ultimate or most efficient um, way to exchange information. So I think we're all going to have to learn together on that. You know, what, it, what are the use cases where APIs can absolutely kill it and be really quick and easy to implement? Um, but where are there some that, um, you know, we may need to continue relying on other exchange mechanisms? Um, so, you know, obviously there are a lot of initiatives going on um, under the HL7 umbrella um, in terms of Da Vinci and, um, you know, any numerous topics, including, you know, in areas like social determinants, which are really, you know, kind of on the horizon in terms of um, any type of standardized approach. All of that is good, um, but we're going to want to, um, you know, be pragmatic about it and not become so focused on um, APIs that maybe we undo good work that has already been done, investments that have already been made um, for information exchanges happening, successful, helping the patient, helping providers, um, you know, so those are, are um, things that, that we're going to want to keep an eye on. Next slide, please. 
So um, we heard about the exceptions to information blocking. Um, you know, in my opinion, um, this was an area where um, ONC really indicated the thoughtfulness that they had put into this. I think, you know, they really tried to think of every area where there might be a legitimate reason for information not to flow and to capture that because we all know that um, you know, putting out this information blocking um, environment with OIG getting involved and um, people not understanding sometimes uh, technical limitations or other reasons that information might not flow, that there could be, um, you know, kind of not well-founded complaints that are filed. And so I think ONC really tried to say, let's um, try to minimize the burden um, of going through a complaint by, um, you know, putting out there as many reasons that are um, reasonable and um, understandable for why information not, may not flow. So, you know, there are the eight exceptions, privacy and security factors, I think are really important, you know, where there is a ransomware attack, for example, or where there is um, a virus, um, you know, that has been, you know, malware that's been released, that could be, you know, pretty legitimate reason where security might become a block um, for data that's requested at any given time. You know, that type of, um, that type of issue. The preventing harm exception um, is going to require a lot of subjective discretion. Um, and the infeasibility exception, um, to me, maybe becomes, you um, something that people hide behind a little bit, you know, this, the world in which we're moving into to become, um, you know, compliant with information blocking is going to require change. It's going to require workflow changes. It's going to require maybe taking new technology. Um, and where people, you know, try to not do that, I think infeasibility could be the place that people try to hide. I think ONC tried to make that difficult because you still are supposed to satisfy the request through other means and you, have to justify that, um, but you know something for people to think about. I think it's going to be confusing, um, and as software developers, we certainly understand the role that we're going to need to play in um, helping people understand this, particularly in the small physician practice area. You know, the um, kind of smaller independent or critical access hospitals, places like that, who don't have a lot of staff to be spending time on understanding regulations. Um, I will say from a, a software developer viewpoint, um, you know, there were some easing of deadlines, particularly around the EHI export uh, requirement uh, got pushed from uh, two years to three years with, in terms of the more robust data set. Um, but um, the, the certification work is still big. Um, there's a lot of development that we're going to have to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, the timeline will end up being sufficient, depending on there seems to be um, some ambiguity. I've heard debates among people who are reading the rule differently and would be interested actually in um, the perspectives of some of the other presenters, but is the 24 months when um, a provider has to be using uh, the Cures edition of the software, or is it the time by which the software has to be deployed. And I've heard people, you know, cite regulatory text to justify both. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that, that this is something where we may need an explicit clarification because people are reading it uh, two different ways. And then the only, the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, we certainly appreciate the fact that there was a six month deferral from ONC. This was something that we had submitted in comments. This is gonna be confusing. It's gonna be a tremendous change for the industry. Um, and, you know, people are going to need time to work this out and to adjust their processes and to consult um, experts. The OIG rule that we're waiting on, and it's going to take some time, is going to be really, really critical. Um, and that is going to further clarify which parts of our businesses, whether it's a provider, whether it's a developer, whether it's a, another party who's impacted by this, um, you know, which parts of our business have to be adjusted. Because, you know, I can tell you within our company, we're looking at, so what does this mean for legal? What does it mean for finance? You know, it's parts of our of our business that we don't always um, have to think about when we consider ONC regulations. And the OIC, OIG 
rulemaking um, is going to be a, a really important source of detail and clarification there um, for all of us as we work to adjust and, um, and be supportive. So that's the end of my slides. Um, I'll just look forward to Q&A at the end. Thank you, Lee, for that perspective. And now we, we have Colby from the American Heart Association. Yes, thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity uh, to take part in this webinar. It's, uh, it's a very important issue, interoperability. It's an, uh, it's an issue that the AHA has supported um, in general. Uh, we support better care coordination, uh, patients having more access to their data. It produces better outcomes. It lowers costs. And in particular, it's, um, it's an important issue for vulnerable populations, you know, people who are geographically isolated in rural areas, people who are um, on the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, strata, um, just in general, people who otherwise access, uh, lack access to brick and mortar or even primary specialty care. So interoperability, better patient, uh, um, better data sharing, and uh, increased patient matching, um, this increases outcomes. Um, just a few parameters here. Um, CDB, obviously, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. We're becoming a more patient-centric system. Uh, we're moving more towards a value-based system in lieu of a fee-for-service. Um, the long supply demand is kind of, uh, um, it leaves you know, your vulnerable populations in the dark. So if you're in a rural area and you're a CDB patient, um, you, um, the first thing is that you like access to primary care, most likely, and even above that, you have a specialty shortage. Um, so vulnerable, vulnerable populations, they like access to care, no access to facilities. Um, so presume for a second that you are a stroke patient in rural America. Um, in the current system, you dial 911. Uh, they come, they transport you, but... Uh, in the midst of a transport, they um, apply several different interventions. Um, they uh, may assess you for TPA candidacy. Um, they upload your vitals. They take your vitals, uh, your blood pressure, whatever. Um, but once they drop you off at a facility, that silo of the EMS data collection stops. And the silo for the hospital data collection begins, okay? Um, the hospital... Uh, treats you. Um, if they determine that you're a TPA candidate, um, they do an endovascular thrombectomy. Um, they uh, they run several tests. They uh, get several images on you. Um, but once you're post, once you're discharged from the hospital and you're sent to a discharge facility, that's the hospital silo stops. The discharge of the rehab facility silo begins. So you see this outline that I'm working, uh, that I'm painting for you, a siloed uh, system where information is not shared. You have multiple jurisdictions, you have competing jurisdictions, um, or, and so what the interoperability rule does is that it allows more uh, care coordination across multiple jurisdictions, particularly for vulnerable populations. Um, this reduces the likelihood of a stroke patient having a recurrent stroke upon discharge. Um, this uh, reduces the likelihood of having uh, an in-hospital mortality um, or even a post-discharge mortality. Um, this is similar for heart attack patients. It's generally a system for care issue. So um, just in general, it's, it's a care coordination issue that reduces, uh, that produces better outcomes and lower costs in the general, and uh, creates, um, it creates better care coordination for vulnerable populations. All right, thank you, Colby. And next we have Danielle from AHIP. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm representing the health insurance provider perspective this morning, or actually I guess it's officially this afternoon, Eastern time. And um, just at a high level, of course, the health insurance providers unequivocally support providing consumers with the information that they need to make health care decisions for both themselves and their families. And we did a uh, survey of our commercial members during the proposed rule and found that three quarters of the health insurance providers already offer customized pricing tools to their enrollees. And the majority of those included uh, quality information as well. 
And so the, the health insurance providers really share HHS's vision for expanded consumer data access and, you know, are committed to harnessing these new technologies to build a, a truly interoperable healthcare system. And uh, of course, having said that, there were some concerns we had with the proposed rule that really remain in the final rule around privacy, uh, proprietary rates, and, and the timeline. And I'll try to not overlap with Lee too much here, but um, you know, from the plan perspective, you know, the way the CMS um, rule is structured based on its legal authority and, and the mechanism by which we have to share the information, it, it you know, pushes information outside of HIPAA um, as noted, and it can be freely sold to basically anyone as long as it's noted somewhere in those long terms and conditions that people click through uh, for the app. And, and from our perspective, this doesn't really drive, jive with what we're hearing from um, consumers. We did a morning uh, consult poll of consumers during the proposed rule as well, and there's a couple tidbits I think are instructive here. The First one is that 62% say that stronger protection of their personal privacy should outweigh any efforts to make it easier to access consumer health care data. The second is 90% thought that private technology companies should be held to the same privacy standards as the health insurance providers and, and the clinical providers are. And 75% uh, said they would not support a federal regulation that could make it easier to find out uh, costs of medical procedures, but it, but it, you know, if it raises the costs of your health insurance premium, so it's, you know, there is a nuance on the CMS side that um, I think is worth pointing out is that at the end of the day, the um, costs associated with the resources needed for the health insurance providers to implement this rule will be borne by the consumers through their premium costs. Uh, so there might not be an explicit cost for the app, but there will at the end of the day uh, be a cost to the consumer. Um, so when we uh, think about, um, you know, just a glass half full for a second, <laughs> there was, you know, one good improvement we thought in this respect in the CMS rule in allowing the plans to educate the, the consumers in terms of whether or not the app has attested to certain um, privacy policies. So for instance, you know, the secondary uses of data, but keep in mind that there's no real teeth in that attestation. You know, we, many of us had asked for a certification process by CMS or FTC or someone, um, but we can't, we can't require a certification. We can only require an attestation. And, uh, you know, again, uh, it's in, in terms of the enforcement, you're back to the Federal Trade Commission and the unfair and deceptive trade practices, um, and we we don't anticipate that that will would be widely used or applied in um, these cases. So, this the second piece that I mentioned was around proprietary negotiated rates. Uh, we think releasing that is really threatens to distort the healthcare markets by, you know, again, driving up prices and then thus driving up premiums for consumers. If, if you think about it, if tomorrow your company put out everyone's salaries, how many people would go to their boss asking for a raise and how many of them are going to go to their boss and ask for a pay cut, right? It's, it's sort of standard um, economic um, arguments that the Federal Trade Commission itself made that it's more likely that costs will go up as a result of this transparency rather uh, than down, not to mention the fact that it's, it's requiring uh, proprietary trade secret, secrets to be released. Um, so, you know, when you put that in combination of the fact that we don't actually think what CMS is asking the plans to put out is, is particularly actionable, um, you know, increasing the burden in a way that's going to increase costs for consumers, plus the risking of, you know, costs going up just because of the economic um, uh, impacts, uh, you know, this is, is pretty concerning. Um, and, when, you know, just to make it a little bit clearer in terms of why, you know, it's, it's not the most useful information for consumers, you know, the payer side, it's the, the claims information that would be put out. Yes, there's some clinical information, but by and large, you know, the, the payers don't have a lot of the information in the US CDI. So it's really about the historical claims data, and that's not really going to help the consumers determine their future financial obligations. When you think about um, new contracts, new coverage rules, uh, where they are in their deductible and their coinsurance structure, et cetera. 
Um, so really what the plans have supported here to for is, is a portion of the transparency and coverage role, which is really about what needs to be in the plan apps because that's going to be the, the uh, area in which the, the information is going to be most accurate and most um, timely. So uh, the third area is uh, really the timeline. Um, I think you know, everyone understands this is a real concern. Um, it, it was an overly ambitious timeline to begin with, and it's going to be even more difficult to achieve now. Um, you know, we really, the plans need sufficient time to not only build the technology, but you know, test, test, and test again, and make sure that there's no unintended consequences on consumers. Um, and even Medicare itself, you know, realized the importance of this in December when some information for uh, beneficiaries was shared with uh, the wrong app. So uh, this is, you know, certainly, as I said, was uh, going to be difficult to achieve in the first place. And then you layer, you know, layer on all the the, the all hands on deck approach on COVID-19 right now. Um, I think we have a, a pretty good argument for a potential delay. That's it for me. Okay, great. Thank you, Danielle. And now we have Alice from EHI. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, I'm going to give just a brief dis um, overview of, of the privacy uh, implications or privacy aspect to these rules. Um, and, you know, Privacy is, is discussed frequently in both of them, but neither is a privacy rule. They really are interoperability rules. Uh, they have um, privacy implications, but um, I, I wanna echo what Lee said, that when it comes to shoring up privacy uh, protections for this data that is gonna be newly freed and exchanged, uh, the authority does not lie with, um, with ONC and CMS. It really uh, lies with Congress. And, I have been involved in my role at EHI in countless conversations about whether or not the, these rules should have been delayed until there were more comprehensive privacy protections in place for this new digital landscape. But as you can imagine, um, there are sort of which is the cart and which is the horse discussions because should we wait until Congress acts and really provides us with some comprehensive, fast moving, nimble action to make sure that all of this data is um, secure? Probably not, because that wait could be uh, indefinite, if not the best case scenario, uh, indeterminate. And so the uh, agencies, I do think, really did their best to, um, to raise awareness of the privacy issues that, that are implicated with uh, all of these new provisions, um, but stopped short of really requiring anything that has a direct impact on patient privacy. Um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, these APIs are, are excellent and exciting, but the majority of them are not subject to HIPAA. Some um, that are that work with providers directly or that were sort of are hosted by or, or directly provided by providers will be subject to business associate agreements, but a lot of them won't be. And so both agencies put um, emphasis on the need to uh, be transparent with individuals who are going to be receiving data by them. Um, they want to give individuals the freedom and um, autonomy to pick the third party app that they want to receive their electronic health information and, and we support that. Um, that said, it is hard for a consumer to understand uh, terms of use of an app and I know that many of us on this call who are quote unquote experts and, and well versed in all of the challenges probably don't read those terms of use. Um, it, the rules put, um, in some ways, the onus on the actor, the disclosing actor, to provide that uh, education. But you know that's been a little bit controversial, given that the burdens on providers and payers is already quite significant. And if there's a significant patient education component layered on on top of that, that's not always necessarily going to be the most detailed and um, thoughtful way to make sure that. Uh, patients and consumers have full information about what's going to happen to their data once it's in their hands. So that is not to denigrate these requirements that uh, there is going to be, there are going to be posted uh, resources um, helping to educate consumers. Um, you know, uh, the CMS rule also um, has, um, has talked about um, having plans uh, post uh, resources on their websites, but that they're also going to um, provide a framework, uh, which is um, recommended but not required. 
um, for uh, third party apps to attest to having certain privacy and security uh, provisions included in their privacy policies. Um, secondary use is a, an uh, issue or an area of data use that was specifically called out uh, because, again, once all this data is in the hands of apps, who really knows what's going to happen to it? Um, we don't really know, and, and certainly pa uh, uh, patients don't. Um, so CMS is going to do its best to share best practices that it has learned from its blue button experience and, and other experiences. But really right now, um, <laughs> this point of, of teeth, Consumer education and transparency is wonderful. It certainly is better than nothing, but it's not going to shore up privacy protections in the way that we really need it to. This area of non-HIPAA covered health data is an issue that EHI is working on um, in, in this sort of gray area before any federal action is taken. How can we find some pathways forward in the interim to shore up patient privacy and um, increase the awareness that data that leaves a covered entity is no longer HIPAA protected. Uh, we're doing our best on that and I know you all are too. And finally, I would just say to the specifics of how HIPAA interacts with these rules and how business associate agreements are affected, it's really an open question. Sometimes it's gonna be more obvious when the apps themselves are business associates. Um, but the way that the information blocking um, uh, privacy exceptions specifically will interact with existing uh, business associate agreements is something that all of our lawyer friends are, are working hard on. And uh, I don't think there are any um, definite answers on that just yet. Thank you, Alice. In the interest of time, I am just going to pose the big question that is on everyone's mind right now. Um, and we might not have answers to this, but I think if you all can share some um, ideas for how organizations should approach um, the timeline, given that everyone is mobilizing in response to the coronavirus and the reports that the, um, the timelines might be delayed. And first I wanna bring in uh, Lisa on this one. Lisa, do you have some thoughts on how we should approach this? Um, well, I think the slide that I had in my deck about um, that four major areas of consideration, you know, um, who's going to lead the project, is your data ready, what are um, some processes or uh, workflow changes that you've identified. Um, I think, you know, those areas are really, really important to start considering. I think it's a question of sort of getting yourself organized, understanding the requirements, and then thinking about how they apply to your organization and taking a look at where you are in the four areas that we identified on that slide. Um, and I think also uh, the, the paper that uh, PwC's HRI Institute put out um, from which I stole that slide, I think is, is really helpful how, how you um, actually determine your compliance path. I, I think that <clears throat> regardless of whether or not the deadlines are extended, there is um, there there are a lot of considerations that you can start looking at now. So you know, data processes and workflow impacts, and and how you're going to run any projects. You need to run them whether they're you know IT based or whether there's an overall you know organizational regulatory compliance project that you need to put in place. Those are things you can start thinking about now. Um, and I'll toss it back to you, Crystal, to see if there's anyone else who wants to attempt to answer that question. Yes. Uh, Danielle, did you have some thoughts to share on that issue? Yes. Um, uh, so from the, the health plan perspective, I think first of all, we absolutely plan to ask for a delay for the um, implementation. You know, the health plan's uh, first due date, if you will, is January 1, 2021. Um, so that is, you know, very quickly approaching. Um, and in the meantime, you know, the standards are not yet complete. We have a lot of questions around um, state versus federal interactions. The federal side is saying, all or nothing, meaning the patient uh, authorizes all of their information to go out and, uh, you know, how to reconcile that with, with state law that may only allow a part of that information to go out. There are a lot of state versus federal issues. We have uh, a legal case that came out that 
uh, may change the, the um, uh, level of consent required for the claims data as opposed to the EHR data and whether or not um, the uh, plans can actually charge the apps, right, instead of building dollars into the um, premiums. And, you know, just with all of what's going on with, with COVID, not, not just the work associated with that, but the fact that it's so difficult right now to get the meetings with the vendors and get an RFP out and, and start to get the technology built. So it's, it's a real um, concern. But, you know, as uh, Asley said, you know, we've got to sort of keep, keep moving as if it's, it's happening. And the one thing that, you know, I agree with everything she said, but the one thing I would also add from the health plan perspective is, um, you know, the, the bid due dates for MA is the second, uh, I think it's the second Tuesday in June or something like that. Um, you know, the QHPs have to get, you know, the, uh, you know, people have to be able to estimate how much this is going to cost them to get it into the bids. And that's very, very quickly. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the first things up other than, you know, an RFP to get vendors to assist with the, the building of the technology. Thank you. With just the, uh, the few minutes left, I'm going to turn it back to Jen to get to some of the questions that you have submitted. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, everybody. And I really appreciate your patience today. And I've gotten a lot of questions. We are certainly not going to be able to get through all of them, but we will provide contact information for the speakers today um, when we send out that resource list later today. We've gotten um, a lot of questions about um, kind of what do you think is going to happen. <laughs> One of the things people are interested in are um, your insights or examples of things that you think are entities that might actually count as these HINs um, in light of the new definition. So, for example, do you think some of these um, clinical data registries or other public health quality reporting mechanisms would count? Um, who could take that? Maybe um, Lisa or Lee? Um, I mean, this is Lee. I'll just say that there, you know, we don't have it in this deck, but if you go to uh, ONC's website, they do have um, fact sheets that define, um, you know, which different entities, which different stakeholders are counted as providers, are counted, um, you know, in, in the different categories. So that might be a place to look. I don't know. Um, specifically about, you know, registries, for example, um, just off the top of my head. But, you know, I do know, you know, they essentially took in the proposed rule, they had the HIE and the HINs defined separately. They condensed those uh, into this for simplicity, but I am not sure that they made significant changes um, to what qualifies. I know that isn't super helpful, but well, and this is Danielle. I, I would just say, you know, that the definition remains super ambiguous <laughs> and confusing, <laughs> and uh, they declined to explicitly exclude any particular organization type. So that's quite disappointing from the health insurance provider perspective. You know, it, it, plans were not contemplated at all during the discussions of the 21st Century Cures Act for this particular um, area for information blocking. So we, you know, we are concerned that they didn't take the opportunity to, to exclude certain organizations and make it very, you know, black and white. That's a great comment. And I mean, another piece of this is how do you think the new content and manner exception, does that revise the need to use um, the detailed fee and licensing exceptions? Any comments on that? Yeah, I can definitely comment. This is Lee. Um, we've paid a lot of attention to software developers, as you can imagine, to the uh, fee ideas that were in there. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversation going into uh, from Congress all the way out through the first draft on what role um, pricing pays in inhibiting information exchange. And I think it's a legitimate conversation to have. Um, you know, where they landed is um, I mean, specifically on the on the fee part, is they um, de declined to say that they would define uh, what was a reasonable fee. They did say, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are places that you just can't 
um, imposed fees like directly to patients for their own information. Um, but really where they landed is um, market-driven pricing structures um, that there has to be a consistency in pricing. So uh, what we charge, for example, to medium-sized hospitals um, needs to be consistent. Um, you can't, you know, charge a significant delta for a hospital that just isn't good at negotiating their pricing. Um, so yeah. they, they landed on that. Um, Danielle, what about the CMS rule? It specifies plans like Medicare Advantage and Medicaid. Do you think the CMS and ONC rules um, will impact standalone Part D plans? Because they don't appear to be identified specifically. Yeah, so the, it, it, they are, there are some exceptions to the rule. So just a reminder of who's in and out. Um, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid managed care plans, the state's Medicaid and CHIP plans, and then the qualified health plans in the federally facilitated exchange, those are all in. What's out are the cost plans, the prescription, standalone prescription drug plans, PACE, standalone dental, and then the shop plans. So um, the MA plans that provide Part D have to include um, some of their formulary lists and their, their claim spend for the drugs, et cetera, but the standalone um, uh, drug plans do not are not actually subject to this on their own. Great. And Lisa, um, do the rules require providers to make EHI available to patients via API from a third party app of their choice, or do those only apply to payers? Oh no, it uh, it definitely applies to providers. So they need to make um, they they need to provide access to the EHR data uh, through an API, basically using any app that the requesting patient wants to bring. So if claim system vendors are going to provide API access to EHI on behalf of the health plan, then are they required to fulfill the certification requirements? Um, um, no, actually, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We had the same answer, so you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can. I, so I don't, I don't, uh, my, my expertise is more on the provider side, so you go ahead. Yeah, well, on the on the payer side, they do say that the the payer the payer side literally the payer op APIs that the third party apps are going to connect to does not in any way have to be certified. Whether and if that's even if it's somebody doing it on your behalf. Great, um, Alice. Since consumers don't really want any of this, I mean, owing <laughs> to compromises in privacy, um, do you think there's any effort to get kind of the consumer view of this in front of Congress? I mean, what do you think about the consumer piece of this? Um, I assume that there is because of all of the consumer groups that are so focused on this issue generally and have been so focused on these rules. You know, again, I think that there's been a big effort to build in transparency and consumer education as much as possible into the requirements, but the congressional piece and the advocacy for what what we want um, from an actual privacy legislation piece uh, remains a big TBD and probably with every passing day of this crisis a further down the road. Um, that said, I have been reading a lot of really interesting articles on this whole COVID thing about how patients now more than ever want their data to be liquid and they want access to their health information and they their health information quickly and now. And it goes to this issue that we always talk about in, in healthcare privacy, which is that while consumers and patients definitely want their data to be secure when it comes to a health crisis, they don't really care about the certification criteria or whatever the nitty gritties are that we get into. They want access, they want exchange, they want good care. And so my guess is that this uh, health, crisis now will go toward the larger efforts that we always see from a consumer perspective, which is getting in front of Congress to advocate for themselves. And I think that uh, the privacy element of it will always be part of it, but um, the consumer perspective in a time of crisis tends to be, we just need our data and we can worry about privacy later. Uh, I think it really falls to the rest of us sometimes to be working behind the scenes to make sure that that access is granted, but is done so in a way that takes the responsibility out of the consumer or patient's hands to make sure that it's safe. 
Yeah, this is Danielle. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it shouldn't be a choice between protecting your privacy and accessing your data, right? That's what we're bringing to Congress and asking them is to fill this gap in the, the federal privacy framework so that it, it's not a choice. Um, but if you think about that Google app, right, that's out, you know, out there now in some parts of California that is, you know, looking at your coronavirus uh, risk, think about this time next year where they could check and say, hey, would you like your health plan claims to flow in here too, right? And then it's at least three months of access of that entire claims history for that patient. And that information for is by no means limited to their coronavirus risk, right? So all of that information that then flows to that third party app that is um, in all likelihood not under HIPAA can then be you know, bought and sold at an individually identifiable lo level just by sort of putting some information in your you know, terms and conditions. So I think once people kind of realize that and we, we get a, cu a couple of those cases getting media, people will realize what's, what's at stake. And I actually think that's a great, I know we've gone a little bit over, that's actually a really, um, we've kind of come full circle back to discussing the coronavirus again and the impact this has. Um, I, unfortunately, we were not able to get through all of the questions today and we did have a lot. So um, I am again going to tell you we are sending out a set of resources. Um, we will make the information available if you'd like to reach out to the speakers individually. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank PwC again for their generosity and for offering incredible um, report. Again, it's really great detailed information there um, that you'll want to get your hands on. So um, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. I wish you the best of health and um, social distance. So um, stay healthy and have a great day. Bye.